I'm Carl Stutzman, Director of Library Services at AMBS. Our library and bookstore team has traditionally hosted book signings for new books related to AMBS. Since we couldn't do that in person, we decided to do it on Zoom instead. Today, it's our pleasure to have with us Dr. Sarah Wanger Shank, author of the new book, Tongue Tied, Learning the Lost Art of Talking About Faith, Herald Press 2021. Sarah Wanger Shank is a theologian, preacher, and the author of six books. She served as president here at AMBS for almost 10 years, where her blog, Practicing Reconciliation, was lauded as a steady and deeply theological resource in anxious and polarized times. Shank earned degrees from Eastern Mennonite University, Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary, and Union Presbyterian Seminary in Richmond, Virginia. For nine years, she and her husband, Gerald Shank, served as students and teachers in the former Yugoslavia, and she has served on the faculty and administration of Eastern Mennonite Seminary. Hello, Sarah. I wonder if you could please tell us a bit of the story of how this book came to be and what your writing process was like. Greetings, Carl, and everyone listening in. So happy to be invited into this AMBS library and bookstore event to talk about tongue tied. Let's hope I'm not tongue tied in the process. <laughs> but I, yes, uh, a bit of, of the story about how this book came to be. I um, sort of the looking back a bit into my personal history and then the more recent uh, events, as a young adult, I was a very sort of private, uh, reserved person who found it challenging to speak up verbally. And I really found my voice through writing. Um, and, and one of the first big adventures in writing was my first book called, and then there were three, an ode to parenthood uh, in, um, Oh, I'm not going to remember the date right now. It was in the early 80s. And um, that grew out of an article that I wrote, Liberated to be a Mother. I am a daughter of the women's liberation movement. And much of what that movement was concerned about was that women find voices outside the home, meaningful work, standing, and here I was a mother and experiencing a lot of learning as a mother. And so in tr my, my, my writing voice was in trying to reframe, sort of a narrative reframing of the meaning of liberation. Um, and it evolved into this book project. And that has led to uh, sort of many more projects that involve um, Reflection on the meaning of words and how we use words. Uh, and the next book was Why Not Celebrate? Uh, how we use words to communicate about faith in daily down-to-earth ways. Uh, along with practices, I am a practical theologian. And so my entire adult life really has been involved in trying to find words, ways to communicate, ways to embody faith that are authentic and ring true with who we really are. And that this particular book grew out of an invitation from acquisitions editor, uh, Valerie Weaver Zerker at Herald Press. She's, she's moved on to Fortress Press, but she invited a proposal. She'd seen a column I did on a concern that we're losing our ability to talk meaningfully about faith. And uh, in an AMBS window, she saw that column and said, would you like to write about this? Um, create a book proposal. Well, I was very intrigued by the idea, um, said I didn't have time. But a year later, as I was approaching retirement, suddenly I was alive to this possibility and uh, checked back with her. She was still open to proposals. So I sent that to her and um, she gave good feedback. I got good feedback from AMBS's David Kramer. And 
To my surprise, Harold Press offered me a contract based on that book proposal and extended chapter outline. Um, I really enjoyed the big picture mapping of what this might include. Um, and, and then, um, you know, in retirement was able to dive in, do significant research, um, write individual chapters, seek broad feedback after I had a first dra draft, uh, much of which came from wise pe persons at AMBS, family members and others, significantly revised. And then here we have the final draft, which didn't take a lot of, of work, further work after the uh, after Harold Press received it. So that's in a nutshell, uh, sort of the, the long history and then the more recent prompts from, from Valerie um, and uh, good feedback from a whole circle of wise people. Great, thank you so much. Um, I think that leads right into the next question that I had, um, which is something about you know, the experiences that prepared you for writing the book, specifically how your service as president at AMBS during a polarized time, um, how did that inform your understanding of the need for reclaiming um, this lost art? Yes, well, I, uh, you know, I was involved at AMBS when I wrote the proposal. We're, we're a community where talk about faith happens every day in deeply, profoundly meaningful ways. AMBS is a community where, you know, there was a lot of freedom and joy and breaking words open and examining their sort of multivalent, many layered meanings. Um, and I, I ha had that community as my, my base when I went out and met many diverse people who come from all over. And my way of approaching things was to listen deeply, to meet people where they are, to hear what we had in common, what is it you care about. Sometimes I heard from people who were very concerned about what AMBS was teaching or about you know things in general and used words like biblical authority AMBS is too political, caring about mission, evangelism, who are the evangelicals, what does it mean, inerrancy, and, you know, these, these kinds of words were, were, were bandied about. And my challenge was to listen to where people were coming from, what was behind the words, how do we open them how do I reframe things so that we can find common ground, uh, find what it is we share in faith? How do we find a language that names what is at the heart of what motivates people and, and, um, and invites their loyalty and trust? Yeah, thank you. Um, that's difficult work. Um, and thank you for accompanying us at AMBS through that uh, time. Um, and I know um, your book talks in detail about this, so I don't want to uh, do too many spoilers here. Um, but I wonder if you can briefly speak to some of the factors that have caused Christian communities, um, maybe beyond AMBS, uh, to lose this art of speaking about faith. Well, it is, yeah, that's that, that's a, a big part of where I go early in the book. The first third of the book or so is to try to examine what it is that makes us reluctant to talk about faith. And there are so many complex reasons, and it's nuanced differently for everyone. Uh, but I, I try to tease out some of those um, things that, that I'm, I'm in touch with that make it hard to talk about faith. Um, some of it is because faith talk seems so out of touch with reality. It has a sort of um, virtual 
reality to it, an artificiality with a kind of pious veneer that doesn't connect with real moral issues of our day, like racism, sexism, climate change, political and church, church polarization. That's the, so we we want nothing to do with it because it's 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 unreal. It's it's artificial. I think another reason is because God is really incomprehensible. In many ways, God is beyond understanding. So how are we to talk about someone who in, in many respects is unknowable? And who are we to, 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 you know, deign to say something about God um, when there's so much mystery and, and unknown? Um, another reason is because much talk about God has been hurtful, hateful, hypocritical, <laughs> and judgmental. So again, we want nothing to do with it. Uh, God words have been used in, in damaging ways. Um, and another reason is because often God talk is like a package deal. It's, it's, you know, there is a doctrine of how you talk about God. There are prescribed ways, right and wrong ways. And don't you dare suggest otherwise or, you know, ask too many questions, wondering questions, because the God is, I mean, is holy and other. And so, you know, uh, I think one of the biggest uh, or most Pervasive reasons is simply because we haven't heard faith talk modeled very well. We haven't heard friends or family members talk about God in ways that are that feel trustworthy, that are down to earth, that are embodied, that are honest about you know what we don't know as well as what we 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 think we know as you know we've come to believe. So those are, those are some of the reasons uh, I think we found it hard to talk about faith, talk about God. Yeah, that really resonates for me. Um, so I appreciate that uh, little nugget of what's in the book. Um, and yeah, I think um, another direction I wanted to explore a little bit is um, that you're, you talked here about modeling of uh, family and friends and so forth. Um, and your book talks about some of your family and friends um, and the ways that they've accompanied you on this journey. Um, I'm wondering how your own family sustained and challenged you as you wrote and as you prepared uh, for this. Yeah, well, family is a huge part of my story. I, I, um, you know, grew up in a in a family that was rich with with language and stories and poetry and scripture, um, and so I felt sustained by that that family history, that family experience, uh, both you know as a child and and into adulthood. Um, that that serves as a kind of um, seedbed for where I went, and then in the more immediate time frame, you know, I am I am retired. I have uh, grandchildren coming by a, a lot. <laughs> grandchildren are here a lot, and and um, I think about how does one sort of personify and talk about faith and God and the wonder of the beautiful world. So they provide sort of everyday opportunities to reflect on why this matters for their life and flourishing. Um, my family, my, my husband in particular, so, uh, provided support for me, um, space to, to be alone, to reflect, to do the reading and deep reflection that that's needed. Um, 
And uh, family also were among those who provided great feedback to me. They know me, they, <laughs> you know, you can't get away with much with family. And so, uh, you know, the level of transparency and, and engagement that they offered me was, was a great gift. Great. Yeah, I'm uh, inspired by that narrative around family um, and what it can be. Um, and so one of my kind of wonderings as I worked through the book um, was that a kind of powerful part of your own ministry has been truth telling. Um, and this comes out in various ways in the book. Um, but speaking personally, I'm someone who resists truth because I want everyone to just be happy. Um, and that's sometimes behind my reluctance to speak truthfully about faith in contexts where people might disagree with me. Um, and so I can kind of be like the perfect evangelical when I'm with fundamentalists and the perfect agnostic when I'm with atheists. Um, but not tell that story convincingly and truthfully. Um, I'm wondering how someone like me um, might move beyond a desire to please others and speak that truth. Wow. <laughs> oh, yes. Truth telling, Carl. How do we do it? How do we, you know, I think I certainly have grown in my ability over the years as I become more confident in my own voice and where I stand, um, there is a there is a great deal of um, of that, you know, maturation, maturing in in finding one's footing and where where one can stand with some measure of confidence and and humility. Um, becoming more humble is 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 a big part of the aging process. And as I, I think I say in the book, I love the definition of humility that I got from, from feminist theologian, Rosemary Radford Ruther, who said in class one day, humility is, you know, not being down on yourself or, uh, you know, uh, giving in, but it's about realistic self-knowledge. And, uh, you know, I, I find in truth telling that there is, there is a great deal of self-examination that happens. What do I know? What I what don't I know? What where have I um, where can I improve in how I give a clear, transparent response to my regrets, um, my failures, um, along with what I have learned and what I am confident about and what I have seen and heard and uh, would love to tell you about. So one of it, it, I had an interview oh several weeks ago with a with a, a talk show host for, based in in Arizona that called the the God Show. Apparently, it's an institution in Arizona. And uh, one of the questions he said was, "Well, you know what? What if you what? In addition to you know." around the table, you never talk about sex, politics, and religion, because it'll turn into a pie fight. He says, well, okay, so you're, you're being also sort of nice and polite about things. What if your grandson came home and said, you know, my teacher is really, is a, is a Hindu, Hindu and talking, you know, very, in very attractive ways about the Hindu faith, and, and I'm rather drawn to, to what it means to yeah, Hindu. And how would you respond to your grandson whom you love so dearly? And I said, well, you know, this goes to one of my first principles. Uh, at first, listen, listen, tell me, dear grandson, uh, what is it that, that you're drawn to? Tell me your experience and what it is that attracts you. And then, you know, in humility saying, you know, this is my experience. This is how God has come near to me in Jesus Christ. Uh, may I, you know, having prefaced, may I tell you about, you know, my own experience. And so learning to both listen deeply and appreciate 
where the other is coming from. What is it? What are what are the what is motivating? What are the fears? What is what is what has captured the imagination? And then going to what allowing uh, you know what what has has uh, captured my loyalty, captured my faith, uh, my my trust. Um, so th that's sort of a long answer, um, but there is there is uh, the wisdom, the maturation, the humility that comes from age that frees one. Certainly has freed me to say this is this has been my experience. This is what I have learned. This is what I regret and what I now see. And being authentic and honest, transparent with that in a way that is full of conviction and love and the authority that comes with experience backed up by the wisdom tradition, drawing on the wells of scripture, all of that uh, become a part of what one can offer in those moments of honest sharing. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, and I think all of us are on a journey of um, learning these things. Some of us newer at it than others. Um, and so thank you for being a teacher um, along the way. Um, another question here, uh, taking this in a slightly different direction, um, is kind of what, how current events, um, things like COVID-19 and systemic racism uh, that were really coming to the fore as you wrote this book, um, how that shaped um, your understandings and your um, book project even. Yeah, um, great question. You know, I, I think in certainly writing this project, when these things, writing this book while these, some of these things were, were blowing up in, in very explicit, painful ways, um, helped me reflect more deeply on how language is used to create systems of oppression, racism, doctrine of discovery, colonial forms of mission. Um, you know, I, I'm very, uh, very familiar from experience of how Swiss German ethnic Mennonite enclaves, uh, you know, the, their bishops had powerful ways to use language to control and to silence, to marginalize, to privilege some voices over other voices. Um, and it certainly much of what was, was done and intended was, 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 for, was for good but had the adverse effect of, um, of marginalizing and silencing. So I've seen how words control for good and words can be used to, um, to, to speak prophetically, to counter the dominant na narratives with alternative, liberative, uh, justice-oriented narratives. Uh, one of my chapters focuses on fortifying words needed in hard times. Um, we need words, so we're not merely tossed to and fro, as, as Paul says in Ephesians, blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery and craftiness and deceitful scheming. What is the alternative to being manipulated by Conspiracy theorists, hate-filled, scaremongers, racists. Well, it is to learn to speak the truth in love. And certainly the hard times, pandemic times, times when these terrible, deep, deep, uh, enduring systemic wrongs in our nation need people fortified with words to, uh, to speak the truth in love. Amen. Well, that's a great place to transition here um, to our audience and um, some of the questions that you all have for Sarah about her book. Um, and so uh, you can put your questions in the Q&A um, and we'll attend to them um, right away. Um, 
while you all are thinking about what you might want to say, um, I have a real brief question, hopefully for Sarah, uh, which is, um, who do you hope will read this book and what impact do you hope it will have on the church and beyond? Well, of course, I hope that everyone will read it. <laughs> but primarily, you know, leaders, pastors, um, book discussion groups, small groups, Sunday school groups, people from a more uh, evangelical background, from so-called progressive circles. Um, I hope we, we can, in, in a variety of book groups, Sunday school groups, adult study groups, round our tables in our living rooms, in our church gathering rooms, get in touch with what makes us reluctant because many of the reasons are different for different people. And then uh, begin to invite each other to be more upfront about what it is, you know, we wonder about God. What about God has disappointed us? How have we felt disillusioned? How have we sensed God show up? Where have we seen God at work? How can we give each other? I mean, yeah, in these small group gatherings, uh, create the, uh, the space to, uh, to be explorers together in naming how we see God at work or miss or wish God would show up. Thank you. I hope, I hope the same thing. Um, after having um, been through the book myself and gotten a taste of it, I, I want to talk about it with people. Um, so, uh, if some of you want to be a part of a small group with me, uh, maybe we can do that. Um, yeah, I, um, like this, this vision of people sharing their experiences around this and learning together about how to, um, talk about faith. Um, I think, um, uh, maybe people are feeling a little bit shy and that's okay. Um, if, if you haven't gotten questions in, oh, we do have a question. Um, let me go ahead and ask you, um, how significant is the practice of leadership contributing to our inability to speak about faith? Um, so yeah, what is the role of leadership in, in all of this? Yes, I think this goes back to my comment about um, we haven't seen it modeled um, perhaps as much as, as would be helpful. Um, I think leadership can invite uh, the conversation in, in general, uh, you know, around the book's themes and invite people to speak. Um, there's, there's a great illustration um, I use in the book drawing on, oh, what is her name? This is the time of day. <laughs> Just remember forgetting right now, um, the author, um, Daniel, Lillian Daniel, um, pastor of a uh, United Church of Christ congregation. She said our congregation, uh, she writes about how they decided to have the practice to, to experiment with and uh, engage with the practice of testimony. And the definition for testimony was to talk about some experience of the week um, in, you know, the, the, the congregation's open mic time and not omit God. Um, and she said that sounds like a kind of strange caveat for a, a, a church. And yet she said in her congregation, it was, it was challenging to bring God into the frame for who knows, you know, 
all the reasons that perhaps some of which I identified. And she said, so this was a practice that, I mean, this, she is a leader, obviously, a leader who invited a particular kind of engagement by her congregation in the practice of public testimony that includes God in the frame. And um, the people rose to it and it's spilled over into conversations over coffee and in the fellowship room where there was more and more engagement around how folks were experiencing God in the everyday. Um, so leadership, I think, helps to create, I mean, it's hugely important in creating space um, for people that invites people to name their hunches about God, their experience of the transcendent, their surprises, their wonderings, their even their disappointments and questions. Leadership is key to making it safe for people to do that and to modeling how that can be done authentically, transparently, honestly. Thank you. Um, we have questions just popping in here. Um, so I think I'm going to go to a question about, um, have you learned to talk differently about God in retirement than as an administrator? <laughs> Oh, well, oh, that, 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 uh, what, a, what a question. I think retirement, I mean, sort of, when you're not representing a community like AMBS, uh, you might be a little more um, free to speak your mind. Not that I wasn't honest in my role as president, but I, I needed to think of the whole community I was representing, which any professional does who's representing an institution. Um, so now I'm, I'm an ordinary person, a retiree, and don't have all of that responsibility uh, to represent a broader community other than the body of Christ. So I am always, yeah, hoping to speak as someone who, who uh, seeks to, to be Christ-like and uh, to speak honestly, but not feeling the responsibility to speak in a way that reflects the mission of an institution, honestly. I don't know if that's where the question was going, but uh, <laughs> there is greater freedom in retirement simply to represent oneself and one's own perspective on things. I like the answer. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, another question here. Um, Given our contemporary society and given the various ways the biblical writers talk about salvation, have you come across some new metaphors to articulate our faith? The various ways that we talk about salvation, new metaphors to, was it represent our faith? Yeah, articulate our faith. To articulate our faith. Well, I think metaphors is what, what it's all about. Metaphors are powerful ways to frame ideas. Um, I can talk about authors that have been helpful to me. New metaphors, you know, I think about trees a whole lot. <laughs> my, my love for trees is, 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 elevated exceedingly um, by walking among so many and uh, you know my husband and I um, did a, a walk of our our two acre place to to map 
the trees and discovered some 261 trees, uh, 136 of which he has planted, and there are 40 varieties of trees. So I am, I think a lot about biblical metaphors that, uh, you know, relate to trees. Uh, trees planted by the stream, um, trees that that provide fruit and shelter and, and host life. Uh, and in that sort of way of thinking, uh, the Robin Wall Kimmerer and her braiding sweet grass uh, is a book that I think was a paradigm shifting book for me. I couldn't say right offhand what particular metaphor she uses, but it invites us to listen much more to the natural world. Um, and, you know, as people of faith, uh, we, we know the biblical invitation to hear the trees clapping their hands and, and the rocks crying out. Um, so salvation is a much more whole kind of thing than has sometimes been communicated to us about a salvation that that is all about transporting us to another world. Um, there's a salvation that has to do with all of creation uh, and, and living in harmony in ways that honor the creator and celebrate and, 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 and uh, exalt in the creator of, 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 of this, this beautiful earth, uh, which we want to share in the process of saving uh, for the salvation of all species. Um, so we are uh, getting close to our time for our prize drawing. I think we'll take one more question and then transition into that. Um, but for those of you who have questions who, aren't, who haven't been answered yet, we will have some more time for uh, further questions and answers with Sarah after uh, we do our prize drawing. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll take that, the time we need to um, continue this conversation. So um, a question here, are there settings where we can unlearn our tongue tiedness? What do you suggest for learning something new? Settings where we can unlearn, unlearn our tongue tiedness. You know, I go back to saying where, where, I mean, what are your, what, what is it that ties your tongue in the settings where you normally live and work and mingle? Those are the settings that you can begin. They are your normal daily settings. How do you listen? How does one invite questions that bring people into wondering and uh, identifying wonderings about God and disappointments. So those settings, I think, how do you, how do you learn to not omit God, to use Lillian Daniels' invitation? not to bring God in as an add-on, but to somehow out of your own aliveness to God, not omit God when you delight in the food, delight in some life-giving event, delight in the presence of someone you love, delight in your work, those are the settings where we can start by not omitting God. 
To go deeper, I think we can form table groups, small groups, book study groups, where we explore the reluctances and give each other permission in a safe space to become more, more honest, more open. Great, thank you so much. Um, I think we'll go over to Brandon for a prize drawing from the AMBS bookstore. Um, Brandon, are you ready for that? Carl. Carl, you're mute. <laughs> yes. um, a question here, um, how do we reconcile talking about our faith and postmodern thinking, things like relativism? Um, so how does that dialogue happen, that reconciliation between faith and postmodern thinking? Well, yeah, good question. Um, All, I think post-modernity helped us see that all of, all, all of the truth that we're able to, to grasp is, is perspectival. It's from how we see it. It's our own take on truth. That doesn't mean truth isn't truth. But as we speak of it, it is from our perspective. Um, and... Um, so, yeah, this goes back to what I said about humility. Humility has to do with saying, you know, this is truth as I understand it, but it is not only truth as I understand it. Here is the wisdom of the generations uh, that, are, are, that, that is articulated in the tradition. And here is the wisdom of the scriptures that are open for us by these interpreters. Um, relativism is, you know, this being tossed about by every wind of doctrine. And that, you know, is, is not rooted and grounded necessarily in a living tradition, in a... a an experience and engagement with scripture that uh, is well informed, that pays attention to context and um, to the best interpreters out there. Um, so yes, all of what we say must be premised by this is my best understanding of things. But let me tell you again, the others who I draw on and listen to that help to reinforce and undergird and elaborate on what I have seen uh, and come to believe. So we are not entirely at sea, but we can't dig in and say, this, I've got it, absolutely certain. No, no, that has been that has been uh, detrimental in a big way. The, uh, the need for certainty and a dogmatic kind of uh, take on what truth is. Thank you. Um, this next question is from someone who knows you well. Um, Indeed, being able to use words and to talk about faith is important, and I am one who values words a lot, too, given that I grew up in your family. Um, but is there a place for those for whom just living one's faith and not trying to give it words can equally be of value? Living one's faith is, is incredibly important, and thank you for the question, uh, I'm guessing this is my sister Betty, who was the first prize winner, but I <laughs> may have missed other family members on, on, the, on the wheel. Living one's faith gives real resonance to whatever words are used, but living one's faith does, does not go far enough. 
we would not know the story of Jesus if it was if there was only a lived kind of embodied thing going on. There have been many, many people who have told the story, who have interpreted the story, who have explained the story, <clears throat> who have, have, have talked about why this makes all the difference in the world about our understanding of who God is and how God is at work in the world. Uh, so, yes, we are vulnerable to all the manipulators out there, the scaremongers, the conspiracy theorists, <clears throat> every, every wind of doctrine that is floating around there. If we cannot articulate and talk about what it is we believe and know about Jesus the Christ who showed us who God is, um, it, 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 yeah, it doesn't go far enough, the, the embodiment, but the reverse is true. If you talk about Jesus and don't line up body, spirit, and mind with integrity to map, in a, uh, you know, in a, in a, in a resonant way with what you say, then that also doesn't work. Uh, we want to be people of integrity, heart, soul, mind, body, in line with the good news of Jesus Christ. Thank you. Um, another question here uh, that's come in. Um, previous books you've written include written liturgy and prayers. Um, what do you think is the role of writing down words about God, either for personal or corporate use? Yes, writing down words of God, well, about God. Um, you know, I had to write before I could speak. I had to find, because, you know, I tell you, every time I speak, I, I, I live with tremendous regret about everything that I didn't say as well as it should have been said, <laughs> that I somehow misrepresented the goodness, beauty, uh, and wonder of God, and, or misrepresented um, the, the, the beauty of this or that uh, um, interpretation of God. So... Um, I worked hard at writing because I could be more precise. And I think often writing can include nuance and, and poetry and, uh, you know, texture. It, uh, and it can become something in the liturgy that we repeat over and over again. And it sinks deeper and deeper into our spirits because it, we hear it again and again, and the words are so full that, you know, you hear them differently and more deeply each time you listen. Um, but writing also, you know, doesn't allow one to say things that bring the body. Uh, it, you know, when, I, when I'm talking with you now, I'm using my hands, I'm using my eyes. Um, you can hear whether I'm stressed or whether I'm you know, able to laugh. There is a more full-bodied way that when we speak um, in person, uh, th th there's a resonance and authenticity that, that can ring true in a way that written words you may not hear or associate with the person who is speaking them. So there is a coming together of person and word in person when you speak in person. Um, so they, and, and writing, you know, words on a page come to have a life of their own. They can be very disconnected from bodily practices, bodily embodiment of what those words are. They can be misused in, in terrible ways because they're disconnected from the body life uh, of a living, um, breathing community. So yeah. Lots of dynamics there uh, for both possibility uh, and, and good and for misuse and abuse, both ways. 
thank you so much. We're um, almost at our time here. Um, and yeah, I want to say we hope that you've enjoyed this appetizer for Sarah's new book. And hopefully you'll want to buy yourself a copy, buy a copy for a friend or a church group. Um, Brandon is going to drop a link into the chat for where you can buy the book um, if you don't have one already. Um, so we, uh, yeah, we want you to uh, spread the word and um, hopefully lots of people will be energized by this work that Sarah has started. And a reminder to the folks that uh, won prizes to hang on uh, for us a bit here. Um, I think we could take one really, really quick question um, before we have to sign off, if anyone has one. Okay, well, I think we've attended to a lot of um, substantive questions. Um, and so I think uh, we can call this enough as well. Um, a question that came in, a housekeeping kind of question, are you having a book signing somewhere? Because we'd like to actually have that embodied signature of, <laughs> of the book, is that possible? Uh, yeah, not, not that I'm aware of. Ooh, you know, some virtual events, but uh, uh, there's, there's something in September uh, with Virginia Mennonite Conference that's planned. I imagine there'll be some book signings there, but I, I don't know for sure. Uh, so far, it's been vir vir virtual events. So, uh, but thank you for asking, and uh, thank you for this opportunity, Carl. Brandon, everyone who's helped to make it happen. You know, the talking about faith is all about learning to share wisdom with each other about how to live the good life, how to flourish as human beings, um, and, and by so doing, honoring our creator. So thank you all for listening in and uh, spread the good word about uh, uh, this book and hope you form circles of conversation around the book and uh, let me know questions or feedback or suggestions going forward I welcome your your counsel your wisdom thank you so much Sarah um, it's been such a pleasure talking with you about the book and um, yeah, I'm looking forward to keeping that conversation alive. So, um, yeah, thanks to everyone who came and, uh, this was a beautiful time of conversation. <laughs>